Okay, just first off, to rule out any confusion, socialism and communism are not the same thing. If you could boil socialism down to just two things, it is this. When workers control the workplaces, and it is a transitional step away from capitalism and onto, yes, you guessed it, communism. If you could boil communism down to just two things, then it is this. It is the abolition of private property. Wait, I will explain that. Relax. Creating a classless society. And it is the apex of individual freedom, being that everybody contributes freely and takes what they need. Now those are massive concepts and will need some explaining. I will unpack each one of the points in detail and then we can sum up with reasons why socialism and communism are confused in the first place. Let's go. Socialism, when workers own the workplace. Now thanks to the ravages of industrialization and its inhumanity compared to the simple life that preceded it, people started dreaming of a better way of doing things. Industrial capitalism, from its inception in Europe and then in North America, created appalling work-life conditions for people laboring away in mills, factories, mines, etc. and produce savage inequalities between rich and poor. Like much of the stuff you've heard about in Dickens novels. But capitalist industrial production, rather ironically, brings people together. Before it, artisans controlled the production of commodities that were traded in the market. And the peasantry produced all the food. With the rise of manufacture and later the factory system, you had more people making smaller parts of a product, think working in a production line, which means one, people were no longer making things from start to finish, losing their ownership of the process, and two, with increasingly complex divisions of labor, work became more socialized. Workers were gathered together in order to make things together in individual workplaces and more broadly across various sectors. And they became conscious of their shared problems with the system. Now in simpler industrial times, where there was a factory floor full of workers all laboring away in what today we would call sweatshop conditions, being watched over by the capitalists that own the factory, the machines, the products, and them, well, technically for the period that they worked, there was a strikingly obvious divide between the capitalist owners and the workers. Workers caught on very quickly that despite the fact that capitalists owned everything, they did none of the actual work. Meaning all the real value and ultimately the profit was being created by them alone. It's a pretty logical conclusion. Capitalists just had legal rights to the products. Anyway, this is pretty much the ethos behind the idea that workers should own the workplaces, the core of socialism. Workers make the value through their effort, and the capitalists, through no skill of their own, but access to capital, shouldn't be pocketing everything. Workers should be equally compensated for the value they create. As I described before though, this idea doesn't just spring up out of rational thinking. There was a lot of hate between the two groups. Capitalists paying employees as little as possible, demanding obscene work hours, literally, Working people to death meant workers banded together, unionized, to take action against the capitalists who, as a result, then felt threatened, literally and commercially, by their workers. Now amongst all this hate, it's easy to see how workers would make the leap and want workplaces that are controlled by them. And even better, a world without work at all. And that leads us nicely into the next part. Socialism a transitional step. Now, as I mentioned right at the beginning of the previous section, people started to dream of a better way of doing things. People thought not just of running the workplaces, but running society, and where socializing production would lead to a new way of life altogether. The workers, through unions, would do battle with individual capitalists and groups of capitalists, whole industries, through trade unions. This is known as the economic struggle, but they would also engage in political struggle. Thanks to the fact that capitalism went hand in hand with liberalism, i.e. workers lived in democracies, they thought, hey, while we are taking the fight to the workplace, let's do it politically too. 
they fought for voting rights and formed workers' parties to change laws and the governing of the country to get decisions made in their interest too. But more importantly, I think, to take over the political system. Workers' parties, all with socialist objectives, started to take form and in Europe became incredibly powerful by the start of the 20th century. So powerful, they even took power, threatening capitalism at its core. This wasn't really too hard if you think of it by the numbers. By virtue of the fact that everybody's vote counts the same in a democracy, and working people dramatically outnumbered everybody else, they literally started overwhelming the system. These workers' parties all had the objective of bringing in socialism. Not like labor parties today, might I add. Now for many of these socialists though, socialism wasn't the end goal. But step number one, to creating a society where the idea of work, as in laboring for something other than your own interests, whether you're paid for it or controlled the workplace or not, would no longer be a thing. Where all people would be free from it. Where for the first time in human history, there wouldn't be a working class anymore. They call this communism. But you don't just get it by wishing for it. And if you're not a wishful thinker, you know it doesn't happen overnight. You need to arrive at it somehow. And you get there through socialism. Socialism is the missing link between capitalism and communism. And socialism's progression towards communism would be driven by the workers' state. So not only would workers run the workplaces, but workers' parties would run the government. They formed workers' parties to infiltrate capitalist politics to learn about government, like training for socialism. And on to communism. Communism, no private property. Now this one usually gives people a heart attack and is where they pull up and say, no, nope, no thank you, not for me. But the language is very dated and doesn't really make sense anymore in the 21st century because everyone is so used to seeing those private property signs on fences that also say things like keep out or trespassers will be shot. Therefore, people mistakenly believe you can't own anything under communism because there will be no private property. And thanks to our heavily consumerist society today, our biggest fear would be someone coming and taking away our iPhone. But private property in this context is not your stuff. Private property is all the property that adds to the economy. Think factories, mines, banks, resources, copyright, intellectual property, farmland, infrastructure, simply all the stuff that adds to GDP. All the property that people hoard for profit, sorry, hold property rights over, would instead be held in common. It would not be owned privately by capitalists or workers, i.e. the interests of a specific group only. And interest groups in this context is a class. Hence why a communist society would be classless. It would not have groups of people lording their access to productive property over others and making them pay for it somehow, like having to sell themselves for a wage or having rents extracted from them. Without private property, there would be no class distinctions between people on an economic level. Classes, in this sense, would be abolished. This is different to socialism. In a socialist society, you have the working class who dominate society, owning the workplaces and imposing themselves on the bourgeoisie. But what is the point of a society that has no classes and private property anyway? Good question. Communism, individual freedom. Now, in a society that progresses under socialism, where workers call the shots, everyone's material needs, their wants and desires will eventually be better met because production will be organized more efficiently. The provision of goods and services will be better managed. Let me explain. Capitalism works of the anarchy of the free market, i.e. the profitability from providing goods and services is supposed to help organize the economy in such a way so that everyone's demands are met. Profit seeking motivates people to do business in society and hopefully produce all the stuff that makes the world go around. Think of a company, one with multiple employees. Who knows 
how the business runs better than all the individual employees who do the actual work. They literally do all the various functions and roles the business requires and therefore know best how to actually improve business operations, not profit. There is a critical distinction there. Under socialism, workers make the decisions in their workplaces from a worker's perspective, i.e. not just for profit. They will thus make workplace operations more efficient because they have a stake in it. And the workers' government will help to plan the delivery of goods and services more broadly to meet actual demand in the economy instead of the other way around under capitalism which produces first and hopes for consumption after. As this system continues to progress, the provision of goods and services will become so efficient that people will work less and have more freedom to engage in the type of work that they prefer and eventually choose, if they wish, not to contribute at all. As goods and services become so abundant thanks to the increased efficiency and focus, people will be able to take what they need more and more freely, i.e. without needing to even exchange for goods and services. Enough time under a system like this and attitudes will change, culture will change, ideals, beliefs, values. It won't be necessary to have a workers' government regulating the economy, workplaces, or suppressing the bourgeoisie, the state will eventually reduce and disappear. Think about it, about living in a society where goods and services are free and there is no state restricting your actions. And look, there will be rules and social norms, but try to think more like no borders. Now, if you wanted to fly to Paris tomorrow, you just do it. No passport, no airfares, no taxes. Communism is the realization of individual freedom. A society where there is no domination of one person or one group over another. And people would take what they wanted and contribute what they are able. This is hard for us to imagine today. I get it. But you would have a totally different mindset if your actual needs were met and that didn't come at the expense of others. You would choose if you wanted to give something back to society. And if you didn't want to, that would be fine too. That is individual freedom. If you prefer to play Minecraft all day, then fine. If you wanted to be a pilot and fly people to Paris because you love flying planes, great. Now, very importantly, the reason why any of this could be actually possible is because of industrialization. At this point in history, we have the technology to produce enough for everyone in the world to live comfortably and with the rise of AI, we might not even have to work soon to make that happen. Our technology plus our social organization can be used to truly liberate everyone from societies where there are economic inequalities. But like everything else under capitalism, which is where we are at now, Nothing comes for free. You have to fight for it. And you have to take the first step to communism through socialism. Why the confusion? Now, for all of you who got through all of that, you're probably thinking, but I thought it was more complicated than that. Like socialism is specifically when this or that happens. And communism is when you have to do this and you have to do that. No, socialism and communism don't actually exist. There is no big book of capitalism, it develops organically. There is no big book of socialism or communism either. And if people have tried socialism in the past, that was their way of doing it. Not a rule book on what it is. The confusion comes mostly from history and the media. A lot of self-described socialist countries have a communist party that holds power. And so, People call them communist countries, naming the country after the communist party in control. It'd be like calling the US a democrat country because the president is a democrat. Doesn't make sense. After World War II, there was the Cold War. Massive propaganda campaigns took place in the West to scare people away from the ideas of socialism and communism because the establishment were themselves 
terrified of the USSR spreading across the planet. And all sorts of lies were made up about what these concepts are to stop people from thinking about them. The Red Scare was a real thing. The media is also to blame for this. Today, they constantly describe things as socialism and communism, like government policies and wokeism, to scare people who don't understand how to use these terms. But if government decisions are not coming from a workers' state, it's not socialism. And if the productive sectors of the economy are not being run primarily by employees, it's not socialism either. Please know, there's never been a communist society. There may have been socialism, but that is hotly debated among socialists. But don't let the media and history confuse you. All we can safely say is socialism and communism are not the same thing. Now, I hope that was helpful. If you liked this video, please subscribe for more and share this with someone who you think needs to hear it. Remember, I am, you are, we are a mystery.